Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. And on today's show, we're going to talk to somebody who's active in the military um, and uh, has been in the military for over 23 years. And, and now, as he's on the later uh, part of his first career, he had ventured into multifamily real estate. He, of course, found a mentor, which many people that we interview go out and uh, they cut the learning process by getting a mentor. So he's in Michael Blanc's uh, deal master, uh, deal maker mastermind, uh, spent 23 years in the Marine Corps. Um, he's been all over, the, all over the world. Currently he's in Japan as we're interviewing him and it's, uh, 7 30 AM here in beautiful Las Vegas and it's 11 30 in Japan right now. Um, so we're going to dive into, you know, what, what his thought process was when he got into real estate. And, um, you know, I think the beautiful thing is, is that, You've, you started in the military at an early age, so you'll be able to retire from the military at a relatively early age with some income, and you wanted to kind of supercharge that, so that's probably my guess is why you want to get into owning real estate. Um, so welcome to the show, Hutch, the Marine Investor Hutchinson. He's a... Uh, Master Gunnery Sergeant Level, uh, is it called Level E9? How do you, it's it, just E9. <laughs> E9, E9. And, yes, and that's that's the ranking system. So the higher the, the number, right, the more experienced and- uh, Let's just say, it, let's just say it, there's no E10. Yeah, okay, there's no E10, okay. <laughs> I, I almost went into the military. Uh, I, was, I, I wanted to be a police officer and I almost went right. into the Air Force to be a, uh, um, uh, military police and then I would get it out and you know become get into law enforcement I wanted to be a detective but I always knew I wanted to get in a you know in a law enforcement or real estate and then I just decided that real estate so I at a young age I got into real estate and uh, didn't go into the military or law enforcement uh, I, I don't know if I was actually cut out for it because it's you know it's you have to be extremely disciplined and as you know so what do you do exactly in the military so initially, I started off turning wrenches, right? I was an airframe mechanic on a CH-53 Delta and Echo helicopter. That's the, the heavy haulers, right? We move a lot of things. So uh, so as I got promoted, as you know, you, you move from um, turning wrenches to you now supervising people turning wrenches to more of a managerial aspect. So now my job is to manage the entire maintenance evolution or maintenance effort of the maintenance department, significant amount of Marines, a um, couple hundred Marines. Wow, that's that's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, what so, uh, what do you love about the Marine Corps? Man, so <laughs> I think it's not so much the Marine Corps change over time, right? The Marine Corps has its function, but it's the people that is that is so freaking beautiful, right? Because a lot of the social and societal um, concerns that that people deal with outside of the military, we don't deal with it that much, right? So it's it's there but not as much because we have our own culture. We create our own culture. When you get inoculated um, during boot camp, right? You, you get to become a part of something greater than yourself, you know? So people from all different backgrounds coming together because they understand that service is the price we pay for the space that we occupy in this great country, you know? So, you know, it's, it's the people, man. The people is, is freaking amazing. I love it. That's a great answer. You're originally yeah. from Jamaica. You moved here like 20, uh, almost 30 years ago from Jamaica, right? Well, uh, oh shoot, this coming, this coming August will be right around 24 years. Okay, 24 years. Um, yeah. So you grew up as a child. I mean, you're, you're, you're a relatively young guy. Um, and then you, you moved here. Did, you, did your family, you move with your family um, at the time? You yeah, were... so in Jamaica, it's very, it's very um, common for folks who live in a rural, a rural area to be a part of different, I don't believe it's exchange, but different um, um, job work, um, work working job um, visas. So my dad traveled back and forth from Jamaica to, to America um, to work on different farms, whether it, be in, whether it be in New York, in Florida, so on and so forth, until he finally settled in New York as a permanent resident. He got married to an American citizen. And then between him and his, his spouse, they filed for myself and all my brothers, you know. So, 
you know, I'm in the Marine Corps right now because my dad introduced me to the Marine Corps, you know, but as I dig deep, I realized that I had from my early age, I had a burning passion to become a part of the, the U.S. military. Look, in the, in the third grade, I was reading what is called the Children's Own, which is a mandatory newspaper that school age children has to read. I remember what seeing this this Jamaican guy. He was in the in, in the U.S. military. He was on a boat working on an aircraft. And at that point, I made the decision that if I ever get the opportunity to go to America, I want to work on aircraft and I want to join. I want to join the military. And I want to work on aircraft. And lo and behold. I joined the Marine Corps and I work in aircraft, right? One of the America, I mean, America's best uh, fighting force, right? One of the world's best fighting force ever existed. Wow, that's that's amazing. And thank you for your service too and your uh, passion. Support, and it's nice to meet, <laughs> meet, meet somebody that enjoys what they do, right? Because a lot of people in their previous careers or their current careers, they don't enjoy what they do. It sounds like you're very passionate about what you do and you really enjoy the time you spent in, in, in the uh, Marine Corps. Um, and I know, uh, I had a friend, I remember he went into the Marine Corps at an early age and I remember him coming out at a boot camp and it was just the stories he told me about, it's, it's not easy, but going through boot camp and, and really kind of, it, it's a humbling experience, but it teaches you a lot too. So, well, thank you again for your, for your service. Um, cause there's a lot of people, um, that couldn't do what you do. Right. And, uh, didn't go through and, and, uh, give back to the, the beautiful world we live in. Um, so then um, why don't you walk us through, it looks like you got in, um, you got your real estate license maybe early, uh, like thinking about, hey, what can I do on the side, you know, when I'm, when I'm not uh, deployed uh, and I'm, I enjoy real estate, seems like a good business. So you, you got your real estate license, you thought maybe I'll invest, you did, it looked like you did some single family homes. At what point did you say, okay, single family homes are cool, but I don't really want to fix and flip properties, I want to create long term wealth. It was that your realization and then is that when you went and found the mentorship group? Yeah, so look, um, a lot of us, the things that we do and the career path that we chose, a lot of times it's influenced by our culture or small community or even our parents, right? So when I came to America, my dad was um, was working on his real estate license. And that's one of the things that he talked to me about, you know, single family, owning single family homes, right? Owning some of America, right? but also, um, you know, create an extra income by being a real estate um, agent. You know, so as that progressed, I was moving across country in 2000, was it 2009, 2017. My dad told me about this idea of um, flipping property using other people's money, right? So I attend this conference, I mean, this, this seminar, it was a three-day seminar, and they talk about the natural progression of, wholesaling, note sale, right, fix and flip, and then I eventually get into multifamily space, you know, so I got to a peek behind a curtain of what is possible. So when you, when you get a peek of what's possible, right, if you go back, then you just, you just wasted your time, right? So it's natural that I go progress forward. So we started flipping down in Pensacola, Florida, with the goal of moving that money, growing a nest egg, and moving that money into multifamily properties, right? While I was doing flips, I got introduced to a 55 unit that the numbers were good, but the property was not, cons um, was not sound. The property was not sound, so we walked away from the deal. But in that process, I came across some investors who were willing to invest with me, and that opened my eyes to the possibility of leverage on other people's capital, you know, so there's no going back. You know, so in 2019, um, we transition to the multifamily space. Got it. And it looks like um, your company's called your your multifamily company is called H two squared. Is that right? Yeah. So H squared Capital. We wanted to name it Four AM Capital because my partner Dr. Jones and I we started out as um, accountability partner. We would wake up four in the morning. We would underwrite properties. Then I would drive two hours to the house, drive four hours to the market, right? So we're working up super early. We wanted to name it 4 a.m. Capital, but it, that did not work out. So we named it H squared. That's for Hutch and Heath. Got it. And and your your business partner is like a, a neuro, uh, uh, a brain doctor, essentially. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. So, so very, very good. So, so, so you met your partner through um, the mentorship program? So I actually met him at a conference, right? So one of the things that a lot of listeners, if you listen to this and you're getting into multifamily space, look, 
if you're going to attend this conference, a lot of us, we go there just for the education, but it's important for us to have a specific goal as to why we're attending these conferences. Mine was to, ident is to one, identify um, better partners, some best in, um, best in class operators, but also I needed, a, I needed to find a business partner because reason, uh, I, I believe I was on an island. I need to get off the island because I didn't know what I did not know, right? And when you're able to have somebody to be a sounding board to bounce information off, I believe the growth will, will be a lot faster so we can go farther together you know so that was the, um, the deal maker live which was a michael blanc um event out in dallas fort worth and then that got us introduced to the michael blanc um deal maker mastermind which is a which is a um a online network that we became a part of and that has been a catalyst uh, for our growth since 2019 awesome and so yes sir you now uh your partner yourself um you have about 26 million under management in in the last two three years uh which is which equates to about 352 units so t walk us through your 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 first acquisition uh did you did you um did you and your partner do a co-gp or were you the only gps in the deal right so um the first first indication that i that i did was uh, one of the things that I really do ap appreciate, brother, I really do uh, appreciate um, building relationships. So um, at the first event um, down in Texas, we were able to, I was able to identify some people that look like me. And sometimes when I say that statement that people look like me, it's mistaken for a physical feature. But what I'm talking about is I'm talking about um, veterans who are some who might be on active duty, right? Who understand the stress and the, the commitment that comes with being um, an active duty service member. So I was able to identify a guy, Brian, and Briscoe, um, amazing spiritual being, and build a relationship with him, add a significant amount of value to him and his group, and was able to be in one of the, one of their deals as a co-sponsor, which is the 55 unit out in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So after syndicating the deal about three or four months later, Dr. Jones and I um, started H Squared Capital. And since then, we've done three deals, co-sponsor deal, um, two co-sponsor and one lead sponsor, on the H squared capital. Very good. Um, and so you got in at a pretty good time because we had a massive run up with COVID and everything. Now the market has changed. There's inflation off the hook. There's interest rates that have risen rapidly. Uh, there's a little bit of fear in the marketplace. Um, and so what are you, what's your take on the market now? How are you guys adjusting your strategies? Yeah, so it's definitely everyone has to stick to their stick to their fundamentals, right? Or, or their their investment criteria, whether you are active or passive investors. So there's still a significant amount of traction going on in in the market, but we have to pay pay attention, right? So the, the National Multifamily Housing Council, you know, they talk about new construction and, and um, how some of those new construction are being delayed. Right, so due to various reasons, whether it be the rising the rising interest rate, the rising lump, the rising um, um cost of um interior appliances, um roofing, so on and so forth. Even though lumber prices have gone down a little bit um in, in recent quarters, right? Significant increase in in other portion of the new construction development. So if you so some folks are walking away from the, from the new construction. Additionally, some of those market that predicted um a higher absorption rate, right? Some of those hot markets, right? Based on the projection by the National Multi, the National Multi, um, Housing Council, uh, Multifamily Housing Council, they're, they're, they're projecting that some of these hot markets will, st will start to dwindle. So now if they're not able to, to meet that, um, to, to meet those properties that those units that are coming online, right? If they're not, if the absorption, if, if the absorbent rate go down, then of course they're um, they're gonna have to compete with other um, like properties in the in the market, right? Which some investors for us like for us right now we're closing on a 350 unit property and our strategy is to get in, in, into that unit get get to the property and reduce the concession reduce expenses right and also increase rent to market value now. It's important that as you do that strategy, that you are focused on um, what the market can tolerate. So, so, for example, this market that we're in in Texas, the 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 median median household income is about one hundred and twelve thousand dollars, right per family. So when you look at um, a forex multiple in a household, as far as being able to qualify for rent, 
we can charge significantly more than the $1,457 average of that unit right now. So there's money to be made in, in each market and also each market cycle. You just got to understand your business strategy and your business criteria. Hi, this is Bo Eckstein, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. Are you a real estate investor with properties and you're trying to figure out how to refinance or grow your existing real estate business? Need some clarity and a game plan for moving forward? I'm offering a free strategy call where we dive deep on your real estate investing goals. I'll help you come up with a strategic finance plan that will help you get to where you want to go. Whether you've got a portfolio of 30 properties or you're starting out with your first property, I have a framework that has helped many investors grow. If you're interested, book a call below in the Calendly link. What is your kind of what is your superpower in in this space? Where do you excel in this whole uh, multifamily investing is more of a team sport, obviously, than you know fix and flip. So where where do you excel? What are your superpowers in this in this group? And what do you like? To, what do you enjoy in the multifamily space? Bo, I'm I'm a visionary, Bo. I, I love I love being able to to see what's possible. Look, one of the things that 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 comes with grow, growing up in um, a or you know growing out of a poverty environment, right? Is that you have to be resourceful. And also in the Marine Corps, we got this saying that um, we have done so much with so little for so long that we can do practically anything with nothing. Right. So um, being resourceful and also building a relationship, I really do appreciate and love the small team concept and having a shared um, a, a shared mission. Right. So shared mission and also building a relationship in small teams. So you you grew up. Would you say you were pretty poor in Jamaica? I mean, like uh, the majority of people there are poor. I mean, the, I mean, most people yeah, so, like I don't know. Right. I, I, I understand. I, I would. I would say, <laughs> It's like, uh, I, I think that's an important too. I think a lot of people in America don't realize that we live so well compared to a lot of other countries. <laughs> so look, look here, Bo. Um, so I've grown to learn, brother. Actually, my son's name is Bo. I'm not sure if I tell you that. Oh, wow. um, his middle name is Bo. That's because my wife's name is Belle. So like Bo, Belle, right? So now look, um, I've, learned to, I lear I've learned that poor is an acronym and it means passing over opportunity opportunities repeatedly see a lot of times we, we don't have enough knowledge of what's possible jay-z said right um he said what he said we don't have the right tools so we get screwed and knowledge is a tool that could, that will lead towards the well the application of knowledge can be a tool that leads towards success look bo i grew up walking to school bare feet right and put it even further back i grew up on what used to be a slave a coffee slave plantation Right. So the people, the grandparents, the great grandparents and the aunties and uncles, right, that, that surrounded me were a direct descendant of that mindset that was created by the slave owners. And if you want to understand, understand what um, what the mindset is like, because, look, the mindset that it took to create a slave was meant to were meant to transcend 300 plus years. Right. So it takes a lot of paradigm shift to really get out of that way of thinking to be successful right now. Bo, we were talking about being an E9 in the Marine Corps. Right. That's a part of it. That's less than two percent of Marines that get to wear that wear that rank. Right. So needless to say, going from walking, walking barefoot, bare feet to school to being a part of the top two percent in the, one of the world's most elite fighting force, Bridget, I'm telling you, it has been a journey and it's really good to be able to look back from whence I came and say, man, it has been an amazing journey and what else can I create for my bloodline? That's amazing. That, I, lo I love, uh, that's why I love doing the podcast. It's not really to talk about real estate because real estate over time, you know, we, we get it. Like <laughs> buy low, I mean, buy low, improve. And, but it's good to hear people's stories and where they came from and where they're, where they're going, right? And it's like a journey yes. and it's not, you know, this isn't an overnight thing. You became successful over time and you, but you developed these, your dad started, sounds like your dad was a visionary and yes, sir. entrepreneur, right? And like somehow he shouldn't have been from where he grew up, right? But he, he was, he was a dreamer and fortunately you guys were able to come to the States, right? And then, it, then he was like, you know, 
go, he was probably in a way pushing you, right? Or just, hey, you should get your real estate. You should buy real estate. Get your real estate license. And that it's beautiful to see. And I think it's, it is so true what you said about it's really like if we could teach the knowledge of this to, to people all over the, you know, not just in the U.S., but everywhere, because it's all I mean, I think we have such amazing opportunities. Um, you can go out and start a business today, right? Like you can go and file your get your business name, file your LLC. You can go out and do it and you can do th You could bootstrap. You don't need money. I mean, you can learn how to borrow or use other people's money to. You can learn these these skills in real estate. You can wholesale real estate. I mean, it's just a amazing thing. I think a lot of people they forget about that in their head, and uh, they don't they don't know how to like overcome that. I think the the military from from the outside looking in, it teaches people to be extremely accountable and extremely disciplined, and and also to be a team player, right? Because when you go in and you have a a mission, and you guys have to be in sync. If you're not somebody's going to get killed. And um, that's right. so that's why I think, you know, kind of studying, I interview a lot of people in, in real estate and uh, especially in the syndication world. What I've noticed, the people that excel are uh, very um, analytical people such as engineers. They seem to do really well, uh, you know, PhD type people and then military people because military type people are good at uh, falling like following recipes, following, you know, completing missions and being extremely accountable, like getting up at four o'clock in the morning. And like, you know, I'm sure that's why it, it's helped you. Like um, you have your routine, like, okay, we're going to get up. Um, I have my accountability partner who now is your business partner. And you guys would wake up together and just say, okay, let's, let's go through this deal. Let's, let's see why it is or isn't a good deal. And I think a lot of people that I've spoken to that want to get into multifamily that don't, it's because they they're intimidated. They get they get the fix and flip. That's pretty simple. Buy low. What's the rehab budget? What's the time frame? What's the ARV? <laughs> but the multifamily scares them because you got to dive into the spreadsheets and so forth. But I would probably say that you know the good thing is is if you find the right person that loves to be in the in the spreadsheets, you don't need to be that person as long as you find the, that that team member. Isn't that pretty pretty accurate assessment? Yeah. It, 100% is definitely a team sport. Look, so in the multifamily space, I think I believe a lot of folks understand one, we go farther together, right? But if you think about the concept of um, a real estate invest, investing or, or your journey in this real estate investing as just one big watermelon, right? It doesn't have to be one big watermelon in your, in, in your hand at one time. It can be small slices. So you mentioned the fix and flips where a lot of folks, they don't want, I think, most of us do not want to rely on somebody else's somebody else for our, for us for our success if we're going to fail we want it to be because of our own um misfortune whatever the case may be right but it is a small group of folks that that understand where if you can show up every day perform and surround yourself with good like-minded people that look like you um think like, like you want and also think better than you right um that you can we can create some amazing things to get the small slices of a watermelon the next thing you know you got one big ass watermelon right then that meets your that that changes the trajectory of your, your of your family financial future and now you get to create an impact right whether it be your contribution to your church contribution to your nonprofit organization and also the small communities of, of apartment um, residents then you get to impact their life you know so the impact is is super deep um, um, in the multi-family space what do you, you seem like a very uh, positive person, which, which is great and happy person. What do you, what do you do on a daily basis to level up? Like what's your personal development regimen look like? Yeah. So look, um, tell you, Bo, um, this is a quote that I, that I, that I, that I heard from, um, from Hunter Thompson. And he says that I don't believe he coined this, coined this phrase or quote, but this says that the mind cannot, I mean, the, the eyes will not see and the ears will not hear what the mind is not looking for. Bo, I was at a very dark, pla dark place in 2015. And there's a good two months that I blame external factors for my situation, right? I was 150% committed to what I was doing and I felt like I got shot on, right? So as I, as I do a lot of analysis of, of, the, of, the, of the situation, I realized that if things is going to get better, then I have to become better, 
right? So what happened is that I went on this journey of becoming the best version of myself, unapologetically the best version of myself, right? And if I show up that way, every relationship that I, that I, that I create, every decision that I make, every smile that I create in, in, in people, the impact that I have on people's life, right? There's no doubt in my mind that it will be positive. And that is the journey. That is something that I want to do until I leave this realm, brother, is just to be able to leave a positive impact on people. So I don't, I don't have to ever have to, I have to apologize for the way I show up. I love that. That's strong. Tell me a little bit about, I love learning about uh, other cultures and I don't know much about the Jamaican culture other than I go to a restaurant here in Las Vegas. I think it's called the Big Jerk. And I started, I went there like one time and I ate their Jamaican jerk chicken. And ever since I've been like, that's one of my favorite chicken dishes ever. <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about the Jamaican culture. You, you know what Kanye West said, right? He said, you are what you eat. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I trust that you're not a jerk, bro. <laughs> um, but look, the Jamaican culture is beautiful. Um, so I think in, in most cases, I believe, I believe in most cases, if we have some more education as far as what's possible, I think when you, when you immerse yourself in the Jamaican culture, you'll find some beautiful people, but there's so many beautiful people that is still a part of that that um th that mentality that was taught to a four parents of, of of the slavery you know so you have a lot of folks um competing against each other light-skinned people against darker-skinned people you know all different different you know the the wealthy folks against the, the, the poverty folks all the good stuff all the crazy stuff you know what i mean so and what you find too in Jamaica is that a lot of people live in great poverty. So it's, it's just survival mode, you know? So take for example, even when I go back to Jamaica, brother, I, I stay on the resort. There's a certain place that I go, I don't go. I leave the resort at sunset. I mean, at sunrise and I'm back to the resort by sunset because this is so much, this, the possibility of getting in, in, bad situation right in certain location um is, is is abundant you know so um it's important that when you're in those areas you be safe but there's still a significant amount of beautiful people especially around the tourist resort um environment because they get to they get to communicate with people that that have seen different things and they get to have different conversations so they get to realize what's possible right but some part of jamaica don't get access to that kind of information because every day is just survival traveling for leisure is not a thing hmm. you know because survival is the order of the day for a lot of folks that's that's depressing to know like <laughs> you know i i think we I, i'm in like my little bubble i call it right and then sometimes i i'm feeling bad about something and i go downtown las vegas and i see hundreds of homeless people in this in the, right. this downtown area and i go you know what my life isn't too bad right like um, and I think that's the important thing of going to other countries and just seeing like how cultures are. My wife's from Mexico and what I've learned about their culture is they might not have as much as uh, people in the States typically financially, but they're, they're happier people uh, in, right. in general. Uh, they're, more, they're more family oriented. Um, it's just a, it's a very warm culture. So I love I yes. doing that. I haven't traveled as much as you. What is the last question? Uh, well, two, two questions more. What um, what has been your favorite place you've been deployed to um, over your twenty three plus year career? Sure, if you was a marine, I'll give you a really marine answer. <laughs> um, but I'll say I've had the luxury. Uh, we did what was called a fish fish hook on one of my deployment long, long time ago. And this is where we started out in Iwakuni, Japan, get down to Okinawa, go to the Philippines. We ended up in um, Singapore, Brunei, Thailand, Malaysia, right? And, and that was an amazing to see that, that diversity in, in, in culture. But I believe one of the most unique places that I've really been is New Delhi, India. Right, and we got to travel a couple hours of bus ride. We got to see the Taj Mahal, which is one, one, one of the ninth, maybe eight wonders now of the world. Right, um, that was a beautiful, beautiful place to see. But just being able to immerse in the culture and see one of the things, one of the reasons why I think I like it so much is because it reminds me of the inner city of Kingston. And this was a few years after I came from Jamaica, so it kind of like brought me home. Yes, there was a language barrier, but um, 
you know, being immersed in, in New Delhi, India with, um, with the people there, um, I believe um, it, it felt like home to me. Right, because I identify with a lot of a lot of those folks. I identify with the poverty in some of the areas that we went to. Um, I identify with the kids running around the, the city, bare feet, you know, so on and so forth. You know, so I really did. I really did enjoy the culture uh, being over there. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Last okay. question: uh, What, what, um, either book or uh, audio book or what is the the one personal development, uh, resource or, or something you would recommend to, to somebody out there that, you know, it doesn't, it could be real estate related or it could be mindset or just development. What, what do you, what do you like or what have you read or, or heard? Yeah. So look, I'm going to tell you that, um, I mentioned that, um, the, the, the eyes will not see the ears when I hear what the mind is not looking for. And I also mentioned the dark place that I was in, in 2015, something had to change. And that's when I learned the word paradigm. Right. So Stephen Covey wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I will all I will forever um, recommend that book. And reason being is that that book was a turning point in my life. That book helped me to understand that I was freaking unstoppable. Right. Uh, I, ha I had so much latent power or possibility pent up in, inside of me. Right. And Stephen Covey helped me to help me to, to bring that out by letting me know that um, I um my future is my responsibility to create, you know? So when you, after you read, after you read in seven habits of highly effective people, you no longer live your life by default and you become a lot more purposeful about everything that you're involved with, your profession, your, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your, with your siblings, parents, kids, like everything is become such an amazing um, purposeful journey uh, to venture on for the for, for the future. So, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. All right, that's awesome. Hutch, right. where can people uh, that are listening to this after it's edited or watching this on YouTube, where can they follow you? Where if they can learn more about you? Yeah, so definitely um, stop by our website, um, hsquaredcapital.com, and download your your operation manual. And this talks to you about how you can leverage. Um, um, active investors to fulfill your your passive in investment um, criteria. Now you can also find me on LinkedIn as as Hutch, the Marine Investor. Right, I post a lot of content there, some mindsets, um, a lot of real estate stuff, um, and uh, yeah, uh, interact with, with the content that I post there. And let me know if you find value, and let's uh, have a conversation. Thank you so much, Hutch, and hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And we'll see you on the next show. And thanks again, Hutch. Hi, brother.